Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he who hath made us, and we are not our own. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. To know who you are, especially to know that you are the sheep of God's pasture, that you are God's people, there's no greater privilege or no greater security than that. This is the theme for our worship today. Thank you for being part of Calvary Baptist Church, and thank you for lifting your heart in praise to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, our great God.
strong in the Lord and be of good courage. Your mighty defender is always the same. Mount up with wings as the eagle ascending. Victory is sure when you call on his name. Be strong, be strong, be strong in the Lord, and be of good courage, for he is your guide. Be strong, be strong, be strong in the Lord, and rejoice for the victory. We 
bow and bless the sacred name forever blessed. He by himself has sworn, we on his oath depend, we shall on eagles' wings upborne to heaven ascend. We shall behold his face, we shall his power adore, and sing the wonders of his grace forevermore. The God who reigns on high, the great archangel sing, and holy, holy, holy cry, Almighty King, who was and is the same, and evermore shall be, eternal for the great I am, we worship Thee. The whole triumphant host give thanks to God on high. Hail, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, they ever cry. Hail, Abram's God and mine, with him the songs we raise. Almighty and majesty are thine, and endless praise. Box is a man Sue and I met and befriended in Phnom Penh, Cambodia. His tattooed exterior told the story of a life as a refugee. It was during the reign of Pol Pot that three million Cambodians were exterminated. Box's parents fled for their life, ending up in a refugee camp in the Philippines. It was there that Box was born. A short time later, they were granted asylum in the United States of America and Box began a new life in the slums of San Diego. Unfortunately, the new life wasn't much better than his start in life because his father was abusive, striking his mother repeatedly and then turning his fists on Box. It was a relief when at age 12, Box's father was arrested and given a lengthy prison sentence. Box struggled with belonging. He was a stranger in a foreign land, but then he found a place to belong with a criminal gang. He stole cars, he dealt drugs, and then one fateful night he took out a pistol and he fired a shot at a rival, striking him but not killing him. It was for that latter crime that Bonks was sentenced to four years in prison. His time served, being released. He determined to live a respectable, respectable life. He met a young woman. She was a Christian. The two of them were married. She would witness to him from time to time, but he didn't want anything to do with Jesus Christ. He would make his own life. They had two children. Life was going well. Until one night there was a knock on the door. It was the police. Bonks was being detained because a law in the United States had been made more strict. Anyone who did not have American citizenship but had committed a felony and served at least one year in prison was to be deported back to the country from which they came. In Bonks' case, it was a country that he had never lived in. He was born in a refugee camp, but his citizenship was Cambodian, and so back to Phnom Penh he went, a place he did not know, a language he did not speak, a culture he was not familiar with, a place where he had no friends and no family. 
There, the feelings of not belonging were magnified, and Bonks reached rock bottom. Do you ever feel like you don't belong? Sometimes those feelings can be intense. Loneliness. Depression. Desperation. Bonks felt all of them. Maybe you have felt them. All of us have felt at times uncertain about whether we belong or not. Think about your first day at school. Who, who would be your friends? Would they be nice? What would the teacher be like? You remember those butterflies in your stomach on the first day of school? Maybe the first time that you joined a sport team. Are they going to accept me? Am I going to do all right? Will I really belong? Maybe the first time that you walked into Calvary Baptist Church. Is this church going to be weird? Are they, are they going to be accepting of me? We all have uncertainty about belonging from time to time. Maybe you're feeling that way right now. If so, this message is for you. And it's actually for all of us because all of us have a, a strong human need to belong. And so I want to tell you from 1 Peter chapter 2 where you belong. And this is entirely relevant because the people that Peter wrote to were just like bonks. They were refugees. They were living as strangers in a foreign land. He said that back in chapter 1, the very start of the letter. And now he tells them, people who don't belong, he tells them where they do belong. And where they belong is glorious. And you are to belong in the same place. So cheer up and have a listen to this good news from 1 Peter chapter 2 about where you belong. Three places. Number one. You belong in God's family. You belong in God's family. Look at chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby, if so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Newborn babes. Earlier in chapter 1, we learned about the, necess the necessity to be born again, and that act of being born again opens the way for us to address God and to, be, to relate to God as our Father, to be, to belong to the family of God. Now, there are characteristics that are true of those who belong to the family of God. These characteristics don't come automatically. That's why they are phrased as commandments here. First are the negative characteristics. These are the things that must be laid aside. You see that in verse 1? Laying aside. That's a conscious decision that must be made by those who belong in God's family. What are we to lay aside? We are to lay aside all malice. What is malice? Malice is vengeance. When someone wrongs me, I'm going to get them back. That's a natural human instinct. We see that repeatedly in Papua New Guinea. Tragically, payback. One tribal member does something against a member of another tribe, and then they come and they've got to pay back worse than what was given out, and it just escalates worse and worse and worse, and, and horrible things happen. That happens here in this country, too. It happens in whatever country you are in. It, it might be dressed up a bit so it doesn't look as barbaric as what happens in some societies, but it's true nonetheless. Those who belong to God's family must never be marked by malice. No payback. No vengeance. Then it says, laying aside all guile. None excused. All guile. What is guile? Guile is deceit. You don't have to outright tell a lie to be deceitful. 
just allowing people to believe the wrong thing, just leading them all along that path and letting them form their own erroneous conclusions is guile. There's no place for deceit of any kind among those who belong to God's family. Then it says hypocrisies. Hypocrisies, that's the sin of saying, do as I say, not as I do. Many families are torn apart by hypocrisy. Churches are torn apart by hypocrisy. Among those who belong to God's family, there should not be the slightest hint. We let our yes be yes and our no, no. And then it says envies. Envy is a sin of discontentment. Not being thankful for the place, the provision that God has made for my life, but looking around at others, making that comparison, and, and then feeling like I, I've got I, I've got the shaft. I, I've, I've been I've got second best. Putting aside all envies. And then it says all evil speakings. There are many ways to speak evil. Lie, gossip, slander, be vulgar with your tongue. Many ways to get it wrong. This is not the language of those who belong to God's family. Of those things that I've listed, is there something that you need to be putting off? It's phrased as a command because this is something that we must battle. It's not going to come automatically. We must make the choice not to be this way, to, to, as it says, lay aside all these things. But I hasten to add that laying it aside is only half the battle. That which is bad must be replaced by that which is good. Otherwise, that which is bad is just going to come back and be twice as bad. So what is the good that we are to replace it with? Well, the metaphor that's given is a newborn babe craving the milk of God's word. We replace it with God's word. Are you reading God's word? Are, are you studying God's word, memorizing God's word, meditating on God's word, living out God's word? That's what we must replace because we belong to God's family. Now, let's think about what the text says there about God's word. Firstly, it says that it is pure. God's word is pure. That is, it is in a class all its own. There is nothing that comes near the Holy Bible. Then it says you are to, to desire it. That means to crave it. Have you ever been looking after a newborn and that child becomes hungry? There's nothing you can do that will satisfy I, I remember vividly when our second son was about three months old and Sue had to go to the shops. I, I can't remember where she was. Maybe it was a ladies' event at church. And, and I was watching our, our son. And then he started fussing. I tried to distract him, to bounce him around and, and play with him. He, he, he didn't want any of that. So I gave him a dummy. And he wasn't fooled by the dummy. Then I, 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 I even took some cordial and, and I put some of that on his tongue, thinking that the sweetness of that cordial would, would distract him. But he didn't even want any of that. There was only one thing he wanted. He could only be satisfied by milk. May you be the same with God's word. There are any number of things that, that are out there that you can drink, figuratively speaking, that are not God's word. May you crave the sincere milk of God's word. And then it says at the, the latter part of what we had read there, if you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Is there a food that you've got to be careful around? And I'm saying this in a good way. Because you enjoy it so much that if you get started, you're going to eat the whole thing. I'll tell you what that food is for me. Smoked almonds. Oh, I love smoked almonds. Uh, one birthday, Sue got me a pack of 
smoked almonds and they sat on my shelf for a long time because I knew that when I opened them, I would consume all of them. I just love smoked almonds so much. The graciousness of God, that's something you can taste guilt free. And when you have tasted it, beginning with salvation, to know your sins are forgiven, your guilt is removed, your eternity is secure. You want more and more of it. And that's the way it should be. Because you belong to God's family. There's a second place you belong. This comes from verses 4 to 8. You belong in God's building. You belong in God's building. Follow along as I read the text to whom coming, as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious, ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Sion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you, therefore, which believe, he is precious. But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. And a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. Note in verse 4, that you must be the one who comes to God. This is the first and most important decision. You must make the choice. Have you come to God? When you come to him, then he causes you to belong in his building. This building, this sacred temple, is described as having two essential elements. There is a stone, and then there are plural stones. A stone, that is Jesus Christ. Look at how the text describes him. He is living, that is, he is risen from the dead. That's the foundation of your hope. He was rejected, also in verse 4, because most people, back when he walked on the earth 2,000 years ago, refused to believe in him, crying out at the trial before Pilate, crucify him. And today, it's no different. Most people refuse to believe in him. In verse 4, he's called chosen. That's because he is the only means for your salvation. There is no other name given among men whereby you must be saved that name is Jesus. It's not Buddha. It's not Muhammad. It's not Allah. It's, it's not Krishna. It is only Jesus. And in verse 6, he's called the chief corner, the cornerstone. He is the foundation of the church, which is his body, his bride, and he is your eternal hope. But it may seem paradoxical. He also is a stumbling block. A stumbling block to who? To any who do not believe. To those who by their own choice do not belong, who exclude themselves. He is the stone. You could put a capital S on that one. Then there are the stones, plural. You could put a small S on that. That is believers. If you are a believer, then you are included among the stones. You are part of God's building. Verse 5 says you are built by God. That means that every one of these stones is important. It's an essential part of this building that God is supernaturally putting together that will stand for all eternity. Verse 7 says the corner is precious, and he is the one that you are built upon. Now, there are numerous passages of Scripture that communicate the same truth about this metaphorical building that God builds with people. 
1 Corinthians 3.11, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. He is the capital S stone. Then a few verses later, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. You are God's building. And so, just as the, the Old Testament temple was sacred and had to be protected, you must do the same with your life. Do not tolerate sin in your life. And then Ephesians 2, verse 19. Now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, refugees, asylum seekers, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord in whom ye also are builded together for an inhabitation of God through the spirit. If you ever feel like a second class citizen, read these verses because they say the exact opposite. You, as a believer, are made a stone of God. You are an essential part of his building that will stand forever. So being the building of God, what should you do? The text said this is what you are to do as one who belongs. Offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. Will you do that? Will you offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God? You're doing that right now, aren't you? You're listening to his word. You were singing his phrases earlier in this service. Let's keep it going. Third place you belong if you are a believer. You not only belong in God's family and belong in God's building, but you belong in God's nation. You belong in God's nation. There are four statements of belonging that now come in rapid succession. Look at verse 9. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Chosen generation, that's the first one. Just like God chose Abraham thousands of years ago, he has chosen you to be in his nation. That's very special, isn't it? If you've ever played a pickup game of sport, whether it's footy or cricket or netball, and captains are choosing up teams and you're chosen first, that makes you feel pretty special, doesn't it? God chooses you as a first, your chosen generation. Second, you are a royal priesthood. Now, that's a double honor. Being a priest is an honor. That's someone that has direct access to God and also someone who represents God to others. You are a priest, but not a, a, an ordinary priest. You are a royal priest. Royalty, that, as we know from the commonwealth, is, is the kingly line. You are part of the kingly line. And so it is a double honor to be both royal and a priest. Holy nation, that's the third. Holy, set apart. We talked about that last week. Set apart to God. You have the greatest citizen rights as a holy nation that anyone could ever dream of. You have the right to eternal peace. You have the right to eternal happiness. You have the right to home eternally in God's city, Jerusalem. A holy nation. And then the last descriptor, peculiar people, may seem a rather peculiar to us. Is that a compliment? To be a peculiar people? To stand out from others? To be viewed by others as rather weird? The newspaper has a section that's full of people who are society's special people. There's an actress at a fundraiser, and they've got a picture of her. And there's a gold medalist at a movie premiere. 
Or look at what the politician is wearing at the gala. Have you ever been invited to any of these high society events? Probably not. I haven't either. We haven't had our picture in the paper for others to look at and envy. But when God says you are a peculiar people, he is saying that you are in his kingdom afforded a special place. And whereas the fame that we see in the newspaper is fleeting, that significance of being one of God's people never ends. Do you see how special it is to be in God's nation, to belong to God's nation? So what should you do when you are part of God's nation? Well, the text says this is what you must do. Proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Belonging. It is something that every believer does. We belong in God's family. We belong in God's building. We belong in God's nation. And with that privilege comes the glorious responsibility to show forth his praises. The one who called us out of darkness into light. He did it all. All glory to Jesus. Peter. He wrote to asylum seekers, just like monks. He wrote to people who did not belong, just like you and me. At times in our lives, we have felt that way. And feel like it or not, none of us belonged when we were trapped in our sin. There's one more verse that I want to share with you as a fitting summary. It's the very next verse, verse 10. What does it say? about belonging, which in time past were not a people. You didn't belong, but are now the people of God. You do belong, which had not obtained mercy. You did not belong, but now have obtained mercy. There is not a person who was born on this planet who has belonged since birth. There must be a second birth. We must go from not belonging to belonging. And the good news is Jesus has opened the way and the promise, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved, shall belong. Have you called on the name of the Lord? Have you been saved? Do you belong? If not, will you call on him now? Confessing that you are a sinner, that you don't belong and you don't deserve to belong. That you are a refugee. Will you confess your belief that Jesus died for you and rose again? Will you trust him to save you? When you do, you belong. Bonks did not belong. The reality that he did not belong magnified as he landed in the streets of Phnom Penh in Cambodia, a country where he had never lived. He had no friends. He had no family. He hit rock bottom, desperate. It was on the streets that someone found him and told him about an ABWE missionary, his name Rob Cady, field team leader, that we had there in Cambodia. And Rob invited Bonks into his home for an American-style meal. Oh, that tasted so good to Bonks. So familiar. Bonks returned every Wednesday night for Bible study after that. And in 2010, Bonks put his trust in Jesus Christ for salvation. And he belonged. Do you belong? Won't you trust Christ? And having trusted him when you do belong, express your gratitude by showing forth the praises of him who called you.
Father, it is an undeserved privilege to belong. But what a great blessing. May we enjoy it to the fullest forever. In Jesus' name, amen. no better place to belong than to be part of God's family. Here is our benediction. Now the Lord of peace himself give you peace, and may that peace be yours always and by all means. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. <music>